and put a dance in the feet of the children come and fill up our streets again with the flowing river of god when you come down when you come down when you come down when you come down
Come on, right where you are. Lift up your voice. The Lord is here this morning. Come on. This is why we came to worship and glorify and magnify your name, O Lord. Yes. Yes. feel the glory of the Lord here this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy and your glory to us. For when we were yet sinners, you, you died for us, Lord. You gave us life. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. I could sing about his forgiveness I could praise him till the sun goes down and I could say that I am a witness I was there when his love came down love came down on me Love came down on me. Can you sing that? Love came down on me. Yes, you did, Lord. Love came down on me. Hallelujah. Let's do it.
Cause love came down on me, it came down on me come to worship you Jesus I have come to worship you Lord there is no place else I'd rather be than in your arms oh God Princes and paupers and sons and daughters kneel at the throne of grace. Losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day we'll see your face.
think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet solid ground sing it again when I think about the Lord how he saved me how he raised me how he
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And all the praise, come on, it makes me want to shout. Just for the next few minutes before we go any further, right where you're standing, whatever your need is, lift it up to the Lord right now because the Lord is here and the spirit of glory is here this morning. Whatever your need is, whatever you want to tell the Lord, whatever, whatever it is, this is the time. This is the place to do it. This is the place to unfold everything that's in your heart to him. So right now, just lift up your voice and worship Him. Worship the Lord, worship the Lord. Almighty God, Almighty God. Sing it.
God. Thank you, choir. You may go down. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. You know, I was thinking as we were singing those, those last courses about what's going on in the world today. You know what it's really about? It's about power and control. That's what it's about. Saddam Hussein would like to control the Middle East and all of the oil that's there. And those critics of President Bush, as they say, that uh, what he's ready to do in Iraq is all about oil and all about controlling that oil there. Well, we don't get most of our, our oil from the Middle East. We get most of our oil from Venezuela. And so this is about a world thing, see, because most of the rest of the world get their oil from the Middle East. And uh, it's not about oil, friend. It's about control. It's about power. Nebuchadnezzar wants, uh, I mean, uh, Saddam Hussein wants to be the next Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> That's his idea. He wants to be the next Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, as a matter of fact, he's rebuilding the city of Babylon right now. And every second brick that goes into that has his name on it. And uh, he, he intends to, to be the ruler of the Middle East. And, and once he rules the Middle East, to control all the oil and then the economies of the world. It's all about power. Here in the United States, we just had a power struggle in our Senate over who's going to be majority leader, leader. Trent Lott made a mistake in, in some uh, speech that he made, and uh, as a result, uh, all of those politicians came down upon him and removed him, and that wasn't about anything but power, friend. It's just power. That's what it's about. Already in this country for a 2004 election, there's jockeying going on right now as to who's going to run uh, to be president and run against President Bush, and who's going to be president. Well, I've got news for the Saddam Husseins of this world and the politicians of the United States and the North Koreans who are developing their nuclear capabilities and all the rest of them, I got news for them. None of them are going to have the power because Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it's at his name every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Praise God. We're not going to bow and confess. Uh, uh, Saddam Hussein or George Bush or some Democrat that's going to run against him or uh, any other politician that's in the world. We're going to bow our knee and thank God what we've been doing this morning. We've already discovered the truth. We've already dis discovered the secret. John gives us a little glimpse in, in Revelation and uh, all of heaven is bowing down and saying, worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb which was slain. And friend, we're already doing that. So we're on good solid ground today, I'm happy to tell you. Thanks be to God. We're on good, solid ground today. And so look up and rejoice. Hallelujah. Rejoice because I believe our redemption really draweth nigh. I believe Jesus may come in the very near future. And I look forward to seeing him. Hallelujah. It's our joy today to have with us to speak to you. 
Gary Richards. Gary is no uh, stranger to most of us. Uh, he came down several years ago, resigned to church in Ohio, and came down to be with us uh, here in the revival. He's worked out of here as an evangelist for the last number of years. Um, I believe both of his daughters attended uh, uh, BRSM and graduated, and uh, Mindy is already out in full-time ministry. And uh, uh, Gary and his family have been a tremendous blessing to this church and um, is a personal friend of mine, and it's a joy today to have him come and speak to you. So would you welcome Gary as he comes today. Hallelujah. How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? What a great looking group. We have a lot of family in here today and, and uh, from across the miles. I'm sure you're visiting and enjoying the holidays. And the Lord has been so good to us, the Richard family. We were I spent a lot of the time of the holiday on the road. I don't know how many of you drove a lot. You're just glad it's over because you were driving a lot. We were on the, on the road and had a great time with my mom and my dad up in Ohio and and uh, got to see our, uh, our eldest daughter, who's uh, up in Virginia now, as, as uh, Pastor Kerry already alluded to. And, and what a blessing it was. And they came down and joined us on Christmas night, and we had some time together. But uh, so thankful. I, I mean, my heart is full of thankfulness. Uh, the Lord has been so good and so gracious to us. Amen? Now, for some of you sitting there saying, I wish I could say amen, but I'm just hoping 2002 just get out of here so we can get on with 2003. And uh, it's, for some of you, it's been a very difficult year, but, but friend, the Lord's in control. Amen? Amen. And uh, I'm thankful for what's going to take place next week and what's on the schedule ahead and so forth, but 2002 is not over yet. Today is today. The Lord could show up in a powerful way today. How many believe that? Amen. I've come expecting, and I believe in God to touch us in a very special way today. I want to thank Pastor for this wonderful privilege of uh, being able to share from this pulpit. We have, we have a, a great respect for this church and for the leadership of this church, and we recognize what an honor it is to be here today to be able to speak the Word of God to you today. And I want to acknowledge a few people because I don't get this opportunity too often, and sometimes we see each other, we pass each other in the, in the, uh, in the aisle way or whatever, and we don't put two and two together. I, I met somebody the other day, we've been here for almost five years, and, and uh, somebody just figured out that I had a daughter, that, uh, or two daughters. And uh, so I want to just kind of put faces together. I want to, first of all, honor my wife. that We've been married over 25 years. This year was a tough year for our family in the sense that how many understand that if one of them's hurting, everybody's hurting when the family hurts. And uh, this past year, my wife had two major surgeries coming into the fall. And uh, we came off the road to, to take care of her. She's come out of those wonderfully. But uh, we've not known what it was. To, you know, we visited the hospital, visited people in the hospital. But uh, it's different when somebody is in there that you love very much. And my wife uh, spent some time there this fall, and is doing great. But she's a great helpmate, been with me through a lot of things over 25 years. And I certainly want to make sure you recognize her. Stan, Susan, let everybody see you today so you can put this together. Give my wife a hand over there. Praise God. Maria, she was singing up here in the worship team this morning. Maria is my youngest. Uh, she is 19. And... Uh, she didn't tell me to say this, but she is available <laughs> to the right person. Believe me, friend. You have to go through a gauntlet before you ever get to her, but uh, if you can get through that, we, we, we'll talk. But anyway, loves the Lord with all of her heart. And then Melinda, a lot of you know her from years past. She's a graduate of BRSM, and uh, she was uh, Pastor Richard's worship leader for two years over in the youth department. And uh, now she is up uh, in uh, Virginia. Virginia Beach area, and uh, going to the Rock Church up there and, and trying to find a place to, to plug into ministry, believe in God, the Lord's going to use her mightily. Got a great son-in-law, and uh, we're thankful for that. Have some great friends with us today from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, one of the finest churches, I think, in America. I'll be going there to preach next week. We start off our year doing a, a week of meetings there with them, but they have been dear friends, and they're all the way down from Charlotte. I want to recognize one of the greatest churches, I think, in, in, in America, I believe, as far as a healthy church, a United Faith Assembly of God, and I want to recognize today Mike and Denise Field. Why don't you stand? And their family that are here today. Good to have you. Bless you guys. Hallelujah. In the time that we're in, the, in town, occasionally we get an opportunity to arrive with Escambia County, and we've, we uh, came from Ohio, and we had a, a very strong chaplaincy program there, and we tried to do our best to influence the, the county here, especially the law enforcement community. And I have some friends with me here today that drove all the way from Pace, 
Some of you know them. They used to attend here. Scott and Leah Mashburn. Where are the Mashburns? Raise, raise your hand. Wave. Let everybody see where you're at. Where are you at? Well, all up here. There's Scott. And uh, bless you for coming today, man. We appreciate you. And we're protected well here at Brownsville. Do you believe that? Got some great believers on the Escambia County Sheriff's Department. And then all of our dear friends. And, and so many of you we know by, by sight. And we've got to know a few people over the last four or five years, especially the Lewises. Uh, Donnie and Cindy and their family, what, what a wonderful family they are, and the Worrells. How many appreciate Randy and Julie and the family? Amen. The Martins, uh, they're up in uh, Oklahoma, but we, we just uh, have a kindred spirit with them. Uh, the Lanes, Van, Dana, and the family, what a great family. Can you say amen? And uh, then, of course, uh, Pastor Kerry has been a dear friend and, and uh, just, just poured into my life and appreciate them so very much. I wanted to get that out of the way. I, I, one more thing, I've always, I've been dying to ask this. You know, we, uh, I know we have a lot of people out of town, but do we have anybody here? I want to know. I'm a full-time evangelist. This is what I do for a living. This is how I support my family. I don't do anything else. But do we have anybody here that Brownsville is your home, and you say, I'm a full-time evangelist. I go out every week, and this is what I do. I do this too. I go out and I, I minister across the country, and that's my livelihood. Do I have anybody here that does that? Raise your hand. I want to see you. Well, I'm by myself this morning, aren't I? Brother Kerry, they're lining up to do what I do, brother. How, listen to me, friend. How many believe we need to believe God that those graduates coming out of BRSM, somebody's going to sign up for active duty in the area of evangelism? Come on, friend, and be an evangelist. We watch somebody like Steve Hill or somebody of, of maybe a little higher profile, and we say, man, we'd like to do that. But, but friend, I'm telling you something. You've you know, you got to obey the call first. You've got you to get out there and do it. Amen? And I, and I just challenge you to recognize that this world, this country, churches across America need good, solid men and women of God who are evangelists. Amen? I believe in that office. Somebody say amen. And uh, I would encourage you, the Lord's speaking to your heart, to launch out in Jesus' name. He'd bless you for it especially. I can't get into the message this morning without just sharing a little bit of my background, what brought me to Brownsville, and, and how important this move of God has been in my life and in my family's life. Uh, I, I wanted to, to share today just a little bit of my testimony, a little background on where I came from, and, and not that I'm anybody, I'm a nobody for Jesus, but I want to tell you that God has done something so wonderful in my life. I'm so honored and blessed to be brought up in a Christian home. And uh, I have great parents. We were just up with them in Ohio. Uh, Mom and dad, they're my heroes. They love the Lord with all of their heart and uh, raised me in a, in a godly environment. I thank the Lord for that. But I learned, <laughs> first and foremost, we are, uh, we are people that are enamored by great stories. You know, we love to hear about the deliverance of the Lord. Come on. We love to hear what the Lord has done and so forth. And, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to be out here preaching the gospel, and I've been doing this a long time. We've been doing this for 26 years. We started out in evangelism after we, we were associate pastors in the late 70s and in the mid-80s went out as an evangelist and pastored for a number of years in Ohio. But this is what we do. And I thought, man, if I'm going to be an effective evangelist, you know, I've got to have a story. I mean, I've got to have a good story. And I mean, I grew up in the, in the, in the era of, you know, David Wilkerson. David Wilkerson was traveling with a guy back in the late 60s, uh, maybe some of you can remember a guy named Nicky Cruz. And my dad would take us to the Coliseum to hear him give his testimony, and he'd bro speak in his broken English, you know, a, a Puerto Rican accent, and he would talk about how he ran the streets of New York and talk about how many people he'd stabbed and how many people he tried to stab and, and uh, of course, his record. But then he says, then I met Jesus. And the Lord turned his life around. And, and uh, I'm standing out there thinking, you know, I, I, I want to be, be called to go out and, and preach the gospel, but man, I, <laughs> what kind of story do I have? You know, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't, uh, you know, shot anyone. I've been a part of any gang. I, I can't remember any time I really shamed my parents or did anything that brought reproach against my family. Didn't have a good mug shot. You see, I was saved, set free, delivered from, from alcohol and, and pornography and a life of decadence and sin at the, uh, the age of eight years old. But I learned a long time ago, you got to have, you know, you know I, was, I picked up a Charisma magazine a few, not too long ago, and they were running, uh, you know, they're doing something almost every month where they were showing 
uh, before Christ pictures. You know, anybody see those? Before Jesus, before the Lord got a hold of their life, you know, and you'd have this struggly looking picture of a guy, you know, just totally messed up, and it showed before, and after he's, you know, he's maybe in a suit and got his hair all combed, and the Lord turned him around. So I thought, man, I, I need something like that. So I was inspired by Dr. Martin. So this is my before picture. You know, Steve Hill has one of these he carries with him, and it's got a number below it, but, but uh, that's before orthodontics there. Uh, but then the Lord touched my life and saved me and set me free, and, and I want you to see now my after picture. Just brought color to my life. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Somebody give the Lord praise for his keeping power this morning. <laughs> I want to go on record this morning that we're all saved by grace, friend. There's not one more saved than the other. I was as on my way to hell as anybody else was, and I'm no better than anybody else. But I want to challenge you parents right here and now this morning to recognize, especially you young parents, your kid doesn't have to go out and get strung out on dope. Listen to me, friend, and drugs and have a story, hit the gutter, hit the bottom, and come back to be successful in the ministry. Can you say amen? They can walk with Jesus all the days of their life, and, they, and the Lord can keep you under the, uh, in, in the hollow of his hand. I believe that with all of my heart. I thank God for his keeping power. I thank the Lord for a spiritual heritage, and I want to thank the Lord this morning especially for this wonderful move of the Lord. We came into a, a very wonderful church setting. We were asked to come off the road in 1990 and pioneer a work up in Ohio. We started, I'm not going to take a lot of time with this, this morning we, we, we started with about nine people and the Lord blessed so wonderfully and the church grew to about 200. But in 1995, we were in our new building, we just dedicated it. My brother, 37 years young, got incredibly ill with, with a brain tumor, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And uh, he was my right arm, he was one of my deacons, he was, he was my buddy. We were 16 months apart at the time and, and uh, just a, a precious man of God. And as we got into the new building and we're celebrating, how many know once you complete, those of you who've been at Brownsville know when you get into the new facility, it's like, praise God, victory. We finally got it built and we're in it. And we were in a time of rejoicing, but incredibly, the enemy just decided that was a time just to, to knock the wind out of this preacher's sails. And that was one of those devastating things. On the dedication day of the service of the new building, they wheeled my brother, who I'd always looked at as a strong pillar of a godly man, they wheeled him in in a wheelchair with a catheter attached to the wheelchair. And I watched him as they pushed him up to the front. And Fred, it was the greatest distraction. It was the most difficult service I'd ever been in watching my brother in that condition. And that was supposed to be a day of celebration in our new facility. And from there, the wheels fell off. The deacons that loved me so much and were carrying me around on their shoulders because of the new facility, the church was growing, people were getting saved. We had a good high percentage, maybe 40% of our people were new converts in our church. We had not grown by inheriting somebody from somewhere else. We grew the, the right way. Are you listening to me, friend? We're put into a city to reach the city, not wait until another church dissolves and we can inherit their people. Somebody say amen. And we were so thankful that God was moving on our church to that direction. But when we got into the new building, man, something changed. I mean, the guys that were just loving on me, all of a sudden, they mean, I mean, like pit bulls, man, they turned on me. I mean, and, and just goofy stuff. And, and I can remember just the atmosphere began to change, and the attack came. And, and man, I, not only was I dealing with my brother, but then in November of, of that year, November 11th, 1995, my brother went to be with the Lord. After fasting and praying and believing God for a miracle, having some of the greatest men in the country lift him up in prayer, the Lord decided that the ultimate healing was going to take place, and he took him home. Amen? Come on, somebody say amen. I mean, no, he's going to be God. God is God, and God took him, and we struggled with that. And coming into 1996, I was so very tired and, and uh, just exhausted with the building program and dealing with my, my, my brother's death and trying to minister to my mom, my dad, and the church was grieving. And, by, by spring of 96, man, I was, I was needing a touch from God. In fact, I had pretty much determined that unless the Lord did something powerful in my life, I wasn't going to go on any longer in the ministry. I was, I was really contemplating looking at doing something else. I'd already been ministering for almost 20 years, but, and, and how the Lord had blessed. But does anybody know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you just feel like there's nothing left in the tank. 
There's nothing more I can give. I, I, I pray for these people every week. People come to the altar. They, they pray. They have needs. And I lay hands on them. And sure enough, the next week, they'd be coming back for the same problem. And I'm saying, God, what is going on? I can't go on. And I was at a district event. We were celebrating the 50th year of the district council in Ohio. And I was at an event in Cincinnati. And I, I was sharing with one of my pastor friends that are around a table at a district event. And I said, man, listen, I'm going to get away next week. And uh, I got to hear from God, man, or I don't know if I can continue on. He said, well, man, I, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but if you're going to get away, you might want to slide down to this revival that's going on down in Pensacola. And I'll tell you, my first reaction was, man, I don't need another meeting to go to. Been there, done that, you know, got the t-shirt. I don't need another meeting. And I don't need to go to another revival. And I had already been stung in the late 80s. How many know what I'm talking about? I put my confidence and, and, and some other ministries, and, and I'd been devastated by what had happened. And I, had, and I didn't realize it, but I had developed a real chip on my shoulder about the things of God, about moves of God and so forth. And I figured that if it was going to happen, you know, the Lord knew where I lived, and he could bring it to where I was and so forth. And I wasn't about to take a trip to a city I'd never been to before. But as time went on, I, I got away. I was in Birmingham, Alabama, heading south. I always headed south when I needed to hear from the Lord. I Just something about the water and the ocean and the warmer weather just uh, was, was wonderful. And I, I was down in Birmingham, and I, I told my wife, I, I said, Honey, I'm, I need to hear from the Lord, and I, I think I might just go down and just, you know, check this thing out. You were somewhere in May of 96. You were probably, what's that, the 11th month of the revival here. And I slid in on a, on a I think it was on a Wednesday night. And uh, I'm not boring anyone. I, I, I just want to help you understand. I, wanted, I want to share this with you. I came in, and uh, I, they had a little area reserved for ministers, and I kind of slipped in. I wasn't real keen on anybody even knowing I was there. I can remember walking in, and I was, uh, the first thing, and I was just a, a walking nerve ending, friend. Everything bothered me at that time in my life. Everything I, I had a problem with. And I came in, and I sat down, and I looked around and so forth, and there was a gal just playing quietly on the piano, and, I remember it was 7 o'clock, and it was, I think it was 5 after 7. And I was, I was starting to get irritated, the fact that you weren't starting on time. <laughs> and then it was 10 after 7, and nothing's going on. And I'm thinking, man, and the place was packed, but no service. I thought I'd start, I would start asking God next to me, didn't it start at 7? Yes, it starts at 7, or whenever. <laughs> okay. About 7.15, this dude walks out just kind of nonchalant behind the piano, had hair down to his shoulders. That bothered me. And he hits the first note on the keyboard, and the place goes ballistic, man. Everybody, Wah! And they start, you know, jumping and press. Oh, man. And I mean, I've been Pentecostal all my life, you know, but I mean, there's certain things Pentecostals do. There's certain things I'm not going to go there, kind of thing. And and the place went completely nuts. And then this evangelist came up. And let me just say right here and now, friend, one of the intriguing things that compelled me to come here was the fact I didn't know who the pastor was and I didn't know who the evangelist was. One of the things that was such a blessing to me was that I heard that nobody cared who was behind the pulpit, that the power of the Lord was in the house. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. There was a time, listen to me, I, I want somebody to hear me this morning. We need to get back to the time where we don't care who's on the menu. And we just show up because we believe God's going to show up. Hear me, friend. The day of the spiritual superhero is over. And we have come into this place because there's something on this place. And we felt it when we came here the first time. And I can remember, I didn't never heard of Steve Hill, but he got up and he preached. And the message was so simplistic. I needed a, I needed a word. And, and it was just like... It wasn't, you know, for me, I was looking for something maybe a little deeper, you know. You, you know, some of those messages were, you know, three points. I have sinned. Those are the three points, you know. And, and, and I don't know. I just, I figured that out a while back. But anyway, I, not that I wasn't discounting that. And especially when the altar call was given, and if you were in the aisle, friend, you'd get hurt. You know what I'm saying? I think I've got the restroom. Oh, maybe not. Okay. You know, and you just kind of step out of the way. People would run to the altar, you know. And, and uh, I had never been, I'd grown up in Avenue, you know, I'd been to Billy Graham Crusades just as I, you just kind of mosey down there, you know. But here it's like, they're trucking, man. 
and they had the slide thing going. They're face first in the altar, you know. You know what I'm talking about. Snot flying, people crying. I never saw anything like this. I never seen that kind of repentance in my life. And it touched me. It moved me. And I, I was there watching this, and I'm saying, my God, what's going on? And, and then at the end of the service, pastor came up and said, we want, you know, if you're here tonight, and you, like any time the Spirit of God's moving, he began to read my mail. I thought somebody called him and tipped him off that I was going to be there. He says, if you're a minister here tonight and you're just, you're just running on empty, you feel as if your gas tank is on E and you just don't feel like you can go, oh, come, he's talking to me. He's talking to me. And he says, we want to pray for you. We want to lay hands on you tonight. We want to believe God to change your life. And pride rose up in me. I thought, man, you know, I step out there, let know I'm a preacher, and, you know, because it's what the altar call was for. And, and I figured I was probably the only preacher there, you know, that had that kind of a problem. I was a dysfunctional preacher. I need to come up and get touched by God. So I was going to discreetly come up. And as he asked for people to come, I, I kind of timidly stepped out. And again, I got run over by all the other preachers. <laughs> so that's me, man. I'm, I'm burnt out. That's me. And so all of a sudden, I didn't feel all alone. And I came to the altar. And folks, you know how it goes. I got prayed for. I, I remember they were coming down the aisle. And they laid hands. And somebody fell to the ground. I go, oh, man. They're dropping to the ground, and, you know, I don't do that stuff. And he came down, and, and, uh, I, and you, know, you know how it is if you're in from a Pentecostal background, if you're from a traditional church. You know how it is. Before you get prayed for, you've got to dump on the guy praying for you. You know what I'm saying? You've got to tell him what's going on. Are you with me? Let's be honest. I mean, you don't want somebody to pray for you. They've got to know what to pray for. So you've got to tell them how bad your situation is. And Brother Kilpatrick came by, and I, I almost grabbed his coat, and I said, man, you don't know what I've been going through, man. And I started wanting to tell him, and it's like, and, and, and he just kind of brushed me off and said, all you need is more of Jesus. But you don't, poof, poof. you know, and I went down, and I, and, I, and I got back up, and I was embarrassed, man. I said, what happened there? I hope nobody saw that, you know, and, uh, and I looked around, and, and, uh, and but, it, but it scared me because I, I knew it was God. And I can remember, I, I went home under the glory of God. I was just so powerfully touched. I didn't, know, I didn't realize what was going on in me. And I called my wife and I said, honey, I said, I don't know what's going on. And as soon as I heard her voice, I started crying. And I'm not a crier, but oh, God's doing something to me, man. I don't know. And I, got, and I started crying. I said, I said, I think I need to stay another night. And she said, stay, stay. As long as you need to stay. I come back Thursday night, friend, same thing. Simple gospel message. People flood to the altar. Prayer time. Get prayer. All right. This time I'm over along the wall over the, old, the other sanctuary. I almost said the old sanctuary. Better not say that. Over in the sanctuary. And uh, this time Steve Hill came down. And friend, it was violent. People flying all. And boom, I went down. And this time I didn't get right back up. I said, Lord, if you got me down here, I don't do this. I don't, I, I don't understand this. Theologically, I don't fully grasp it, but something's going on in me. And Father, if you got me down here, I don't want to get up to your through with me. And friend, he washed me. He washed junk out of me I didn't know was in me. He transformed me in a way that I, I have been ruined. I walk with a spiritual limp. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? I went back home, friend, changed. And that revival got on my church in 1996. And it, is, it never was going to be the same. There's people that came down here. As the Lord began to move in my life, I'll just quickly tell you that the Lord began to change me in 97. I was coming down here on a regular basis. By 97, the Lord, I was down in Montevideo, Uruguay, ministering down in Latin America. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, you need to take this, this fire revival across America. And that's what I've called you to do. And, and, I, and I heard so strongly, that's what the Lord So by the fall of 97, I resigned this wonderful church that was in revival. Uh, we left on the mountaintop and, and uh, moved our family down here in the spring of 98. And I will say this, friend, the only thing that I, I miscalculated, <laughs> Pastor Gary, was I thought who in the world would not want what God was doing in my church? But let me give you a newsflash, friend. There's a whole lot of folks out there that aren't really interested in the move of God. And I hit a wall, friend. In fact, I'll be real honest with you. There were times I made phone calls, and based on where my zip code was, I wouldn't get a call back. I thought this was going to be an open door. Gary Richard from where? Pensacola. Oh, brother, where God is moving. Come on. But it wasn't like that. It's like they're not so sure about it, not so sure about me and the whole thing. So they were, you know, they're nice about it. They, you know, these brothers are going to be spiritual and so forth, but I just wouldn't hear from them again. 
And I had some brothers in Ohio and so forth started distancing himself from me and so forth. So I don't say that to feel sorry for me. The Lord is good, and I'm thankful the places I go are hungry for God. But I want to be realist this morning, and I don't want to paint a picture that, that is not real. I want you to understand that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We are, we are in a warfare, amen? We're in a warfare, and it's not always easy. But God has tremendously been good to us. And I want to give him all the praise and all the honor this morning. Amen? Thank you for letting me share a little bit of my testimony. That's my background. That's what brought me here. And we've been here now for almost five years. And this is my first opportunity to preach in my home church. And, and I'm going for it. I said, I'm going for it, friend. The Lord's going to show up in a powerful way today. Trust me. I want you to know there's people that have been praying and lifting up this service. And I'm telling you, we're loaded for bear today. God's going to come down. This, day, this year is not over yet. This is the last Sunday we have in this year. Why not leave this thing with, with a move of God? Why not leave this thing with such an impact, with, a, with the power of God so on us that we will never, ever be the same? You and I both know we don't need another service. You and I know we don't need just another time. We've got people here today. You know it. Some of you are here, sitting here today, and during the worship time, you were intimidated because you got somebody next to you that wouldn't normally be in a church. But because it's a holiday, because it's the season, they're here with you today. You, you bribed them, you cut a deal with them, and they're here today, but, but you even lost your victory before the service started because you're not worshiping like you usually worship because you didn't want to offend or make somebody next to you uncomfortable. Friend, let me tell you right now, the Lord wants to free you of that today. He wants you to get set free from that. He wants to liberate you today. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to take them right now, and I want you to turn to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. We're going to make that our text. We're going to kind of let it be the, the foundation of our, of our time with you today. And just hold there with me. How many understand things have changed tremendously in our nation since 9-11? There's an overwhelming change that's taken place not only in our, in our nation, but in our nation's churches. There's a different atmosphere. There's a cloud of apprehension and, 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 and so in some ways fear. Right now in New York and especially in Israel, there, there are people that are not sleeping nights. They've opened up clinics, friend, listen to me, to help uh, with those who have, are, are, are going night after night sleepless, worrying about what's going to come on this nation, on this city. There's a great deal of apprehension right now as we are, are setting the table, if you will, for war. And every day there's a new headline. There's something new developing. I just got an email from a pastor in Texas who said, pray for our church because January 1, after they deploy even more out in the Fort Hood area, our church is going to be cut maybe in half. Can you imagine? And this is a church that ministers to the military. So the complexion of things are certainly changing. But with all the, the fear that is in the country, our president has done his best to try to, to, to appease and try to, uh, to quell the, the apprehension in our country. They founded a whole new department called the Homeland Security Department in order to, to better secure our borders and to make us feel a little bit better about our nation's safety. Can you imagine? Billions of dollars are going to be spent over the next few months to help ensure the fact that what happened on September 11, 2001 never happens again. Friend, I don't know if they can have that kind of insurance, but I don't care how, many money, how much money they throw at it. How many understand that the Lord is our protector? But they're trying to do their best to, to put a good face on it and trying to show, hey, we're trying to do something. In fact, it's not only at the national level. You understand that we, even at, at, the, at, the, at the personal level, are doing all that we can to protect our homes. Uh, this last year, millions of dollars were spent on personal security. I'm talking about alarm systems, putting up fences, getting a dog. I mean, we're doing whatever we have to do to make sure our home is secure, making sure that, that our, our doors, put a new deadbolt in, we're putting bars on the windows. Is anybody hearing me? We want to make sure, they, this last year, we were inundated. Almost month after month, we picked up the newspaper and there was another abduction. How many remember there was a couple of months there where we were hearing about children being taken out of their bedroom or, or whatever, and, and it was a, there was a, a, if you're a parent, friend, I've got two daughters, but I mean, I can imagine what some of us were feeling, man. We weren't going to go to the park or, or go out in a public place, and we started putting leashes on our kids, and I mean, friend, we were nervous about what could happen. But with all of, of the work and all of the energy and the money that we have spent, on protecting those things that are near and dear to us, the personal property and all those things. Friend, I'm here to declare this morning 
then I believe that in all those efforts we have failed to recognize one of the most important areas of protection in our life. We have left in some ways, and I believe this to be true at Brownsville as well as at many churches across America, we have left some spiritual doors unlocked. We've allowed the enemy, listen to me friend, the enemy is, is a thief. John chapter 10 and verse 10, the Lord just declares, first of all, he's a killer and a thief. He has come to steal and destroy. How many believe that? He is out after your family. He's out after that person next to you. He's out to destroy your marriage. He wants to shut down this revival. He wants to shut down anyone. You say, i got to call a God in my life. I believe the Lord wants me to go forward. But yet, as you sit at the, at the very uh, pinnacle of what God wants to do in your life, at, at a pivotal point in your life, here we are, 2002, coming to a close, and you say, 2003 is going to be my year. Friend, I'm talking to somebody here this morning. You said 2001 was going to be your year, and you're still sitting here. You said 2002 was going to be your year. But because of fear and apprehension, friend, listen to me. Today, we need to shore up some of our borders, spiritually speaking speaking this morning. We need to recognize some things. If 2003 is going to be different, we're going to have to do some changing. Some things, something's going to be different in us. Amen? How many recognize if you keep on doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting? And I am telling you, right in the throes of revival, right down here in Pensacola, Florida, where God's Spirit is moving, you can sit there and cower as the enemy comes in and erodes and begins to steal things out of your life. He wants to take away your peace. He wants your finances destroyed. He wants this church bankrupt. He wants this to be a, a mockery instead of a trophy for God. How many understand that? He wants to discredit, discredit the man of God, the woman of God. He wants you shattered on the rock saying what might have been rather than what can be through the power of Almighty God. And if we're not careful, then we'll march right into our lives, right where we sit, and steal everything that's important to us. In 1 Samuel chapter 30 we read an interesting story let me give you a little background as we lay this text and we're not going to we're going to move through this quickly so just hold with me how many will give me the time i need this morning first samuel chapter 30 speaks of david and david has come off a great victory with goliath his name and notoriety is being spread throughout the land in fact now he's become a wanted man because the jealousy has rose up in saul and he is out to catch david and kill him so David finds himself trying to find a place of refuge. He's, he's more or less hiding. He's got about 600 men with him. And he comes to a place called Goth, really Philistine territory, which wouldn't, you wouldn't think would be a place you'd want to hide out. <laughs> I'm the one that killed your giant. <laughs> I mean, how many would know that's not a place to probably to, 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 to call camp? But that's where he was. And he made some friends with the king there, Achish, and he uh, begins to ask... Be, get favor from the king and says, can I have a place where me and my men can reside? And they said, yeah, we'll give you Ziklag, a little place called Ziklag. You can have that place and there you can make camp. And as it would go, that's where they, they ended up holding out. The Philistine army is about ready to go to war against the Israelites. And David is, you know, he just wants to fit in. And he's, and believe it or not, he is trying his best to be a part of the Philistine army. If you read it back there in chapter 27, 28, but the Philistines know about his history. It's the one that they sang about. The one that has the, the power and the hand of God on his life. And they don't want that guy on their backside going to war. Amen? They don't want David in that war fighting with them because he, he could turn on them any minute. He's, he's chosen of God. So, so they go to the king and they say, listen, David can't go with us to war. And so Achish pulls David aside and says, listen, David, you need to go back to Ziglog and need to chill there. You've been there 16 months. You need to go back there for a little longer and just hang out there because they, don't want, they will not allow you to march with us. He goes, I've been loyal to you, king. I've been right here. I've been with you the whole time. He says, I know that, but they, they don't trust you, so you need to go back there. And in chapter 30, friend, David takes his 600 men and they walk back into the camp, the place where they reside and, and their homeland. And they came back. And, and this is what happened. Follow along with me in, in verse 1. David and his men reached Ziglog on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the south of Ziglog and had attacked Ziglog and burned it. And had taken captive the women and all who, uh, and the women, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. The women and all who were in it, both young and old, and killed none of them, but carried them off and went on their way. Father God, today I pray, Lord, that this message would take root in the hearts and lives of your people. Lord, what a great heritage and what a great uh, history 
We stand behind this pulpit recognizing what you have done. But, Lord, we look forward to what you want to do. But, Lord, as, as an evangelist, as a man that you've called, Lord, to be a watchman, I feel, uh, I feel compelled today to warn the, the people of God as to the pitfalls of the enemy coming in and stealing what belongs to you, Father. Lord, let this word come alive today. Let there be no one leave here the same as they came in. Lord, let your spirit flow through those who are disheartened today. Lord, as we come through the holidays, somebody is not rejoicing like we did today as we sang. Some are, are grieving, Lord. Some are struggling today. Some are looking at 2003 with great fear and apprehension. Father, today would you relieve that by the power of your word, by the anointing of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Move on us in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. David comes back into his camp and finds something devastated as Devastating has taken place. He came back only to find that his home and everything he had, all his possessions were stolen and his home was burned to the ground. Now that's just physical possessions. Get a load of this now, friend. This is where it really gets heavy. Can you imagine what it must have been like to come home and find out your wives and your children are gone? Kidnapped, abducted. Has anyone here ever been broken into, uh, your home has ever been broken into, you, had to, you, you, you maybe had to file a report, something was stolen, you know what it is to come home and feel like your home has been violated. Raise your hand real high. Look at all the hands. My. You know what it is. You know what that feels like. It's, it's, it's uh, helplessness. I mean, what could have I done? Uh, how many understand you feel a violation of your space, something that's very precious to you? You understand, I want you to, to get a grip. On, on what it felt like when David came back to his home and found it burned to the ground and find, finds his family kidnapped. And how many know that good things happen or bad things happen to good people? You need to believe that. All you have to do is read the first chapter of Job and you'll figure that out. But I, I want to tell you that even if you're serving God and right in the hand of Almighty God, adversity and hardship do not dictate or mandate whether or not you're in the will of God. Hear me, friend. Somebody's out there with their finger in the wind saying, you know, things are really going bad. This must not be God. You might be right where God wants you, right in the middle of the storm. But I want you to understand that David came back, touched of God, and finds his family kidnapped. Finds everything he has stolen and his home burned to the ground. In 1992, we were in the first year of our pastorate there at, at, uh, in the Columbus area. And we had gone... We had gone up to uh, the district office to do a little work. We were pastoring, and we moonlighted a little bit at the district office. The Assemblies of God, we did a little work on their computers, worked on their, their books and so forth up there. It was on a July evening, about 8 o'clock, I was up there working. We lived in a little home in a little nice neighborhood in uh, central Ohio. But uh, about 8 o'clock, I got a phone call. A little after 8, I got a phone call from a neighbor. Now, my neighbor was unsaved and certainly didn't know I was up there at the district. And, and the first thing that scared me, because I usually don't even answer the phones after hours up there, but I answered the phone, and he said, Gary, and, I, and he said, this is Kevin. And I go, my, why is he doing calling me here? And I knew it wasn't good, and my heart just kind of stopped. He said, you need to get home. He said, your home has been broken into. And my first thought is, wait a minute, my wife and girls are there. And my next thing out of my voice was, well, well, is my family, is Susan and the girls okay? And he said, you need to get home. He just answered my question. I dropped everything I was doing. I jumped in my car and I got on the expressway and I, I floored it, friend. I don't, I don't, I, it's a memory. It's not, it's, it's not even a memory. I don't, I don't even know what happened. I just know that I drove as fast as I could to get home, praying, crying. I had all kinds of emotion. I was trying to figure out what I had done to deserve this. Why? How could this happen to me? I'm up working at the district office, friend. I'm doing God's work, and, and here my family is home, and, and how could somebody break into my house in this beautiful neighborhood? And ha How could this happen? And I drove up, and I remember screaming into the little circle, the little area I was in, and there I saw an ambulance, and there I saw a, a fire rescue truck, and I saw two police officers uh, in their cars, and there's a big crowd. The whole neighborhood had gathered. I mean, it looked like some kind of scene. And I pulled out of the car, and everybody, all eyes were on me. This is the father. This is the husband. He's home now. And I jumped out, recognizing everybody was watching me. And I, I ran up to the porch, and as I ran up to the porch, I saw blood on my porch, and I saw blood on the walls. And, and friend, can you imagine what I, I mean, I was devastated. I mean, I, I, and, and I saw, come around the corner, there came my wife out, and she was in tears, and the neighbor, one of the neighbor ladies had her arm around her, and she was in tears, and she had a little, little, 
little mark on her lip like she'd been cut and, and, and blood on, her, on the front of her blouse. And I said, honey, I said, are you okay? She goes, yeah. And then Melinda came up from behind her, and she looked like she was okay, and she was crying. And I was looking around, I said, where's Maria? Maria. And Susan couldn't even say her name. She just pointed out to the ambulance. I said, my God, my God. All these emotions. I ran out and I opened the ambulance, and there was little Maria, all of about, probably uh, about eight years old at the time. And there she is, a little collar around her neck, with a little nose swollen, dried blood on her face. Just a little angelic girl. And at that moment, I said, honey, you okay? She said, I'm okay, Daddy. I said, oh, baby. I felt, I felt like, I felt, I, was, I felt guilty for not being home to protect my family. What happened? How could this happen? God, all these emotions. I, I, I would like to tell you that when I thought of the person that did this, I'd I, I, I like to tell you that I, I was sitting there saying, Lord, I just hope you get a hold of his life and you save him. But that's not what I was feeling. I was feeling if I had a gun. I said, if I had a gun. You see, friend, I, 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 I'm not going to try to pretend and pretend like I, I'm super spiritual. Do you understand that if you're here today and you have emotions of anger or hatred that well up within you, don't beat yourself up and say, well, man, I must not be saved. I, no, friend, it's not, it's not what you feel that makes you a believer. It's how you respond to what you feel. And those feelings came up within me, and, 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 and I asked, God, Lord, speak to me. What, what am I supposed to do? What, am I, what do I do now? I mean, God, how could this happen? And all these things. And the Holy Spirit spoke right to me, right? I mean, louder than you would speak verbally to me. And, and, and it's the most bizarre thing you would think I would have heard from him. I, you know, you, you think you would say, peace, my son. It will be all right, you know. It wasn't like that. He said, here's what he, the Spirit said to me, just as plain as He said, you behave yourself, and you watch how you behave around everybody that's watching you. You're a preacher and a man of God, and you represent me. Straighten up. That's what he told me in the ambulance. I stepped out, friend, and there was a soberness came over me. And I recognized that crowd of neighbors all knew I was a preacher. And I now recognize I had to carry myself like someone that was connected to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, I'm going to just wind this thing up by telling you that everything came out fine. My daughter was not traumatized. We got new carpet. Everything was taken up. Listen, friend, they caught the guy eventually that did this thing. Apparently, he had shot another kid over in the, accidentally in the neighborhood. He was, he was looking for some crack money and to try to get into our garage. And what had happened was the girls were out playing about 8 o'clock, you know, on a summer day in July. It's still light out. They had come in. Little Maria had gone to take a, a bath. And, and the other, my wife and my other daughter were down in the basement. They had failed to lock the door. I said they failed to lock the door. And he came by just in a, in, on a whim and was trying to get in the garage. Couldn't get in. He could have kept running looking for somebody else. But when he came to the front door, it was wide open. He didn't think anybody was there. He's just going to go back to the master bedroom and get some money and get out of there and steal whatever he had to steal. Is anybody hearing me? We left a door unlocked. We left something undone. The enemy got in and, and did some damage. Now, friend, I, I want you to understand, unless you have been violated to that degree, unless something like that's happened to you, you can't fully relate. You read a story like this in 1 Samuel, you go, well, yeah, that's, that's kind of tough. Friend, they took his wife and his kids. And what does David do? The first thing he does, he cries out to God. Just follow along there with me. He cries out to the Lord. He, he puts on his his holy garments, and begins to cry out, God, what do I do? And he was grieved. The Bible says he cried. They, he wept so hard. He wept so long. He cried until he didn't have any more strength to cry. Am I talking to anybody here this morning? Have you ever wept till there was no more strength to weep? I can't go any farther, Lord. I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I'm grieved, and I, and I don't know. I, I'm at my end. Listen, friend, I'm telling you, the Lord puts us in those positions so He can show up in our lives. He allows us to come to the bottom. He allows it to get to in a place in your life where you say, man, I don't have any other options, and He becomes the only option. Can you say amen? And He'll allow that to come into your life. He'll allow a circumstance, a situation to get you broken before Him. And David went right to the one he should have gone to. He said, God, what am I going to do? Those around him, the 600 faithful followers, boy, I can sure relate to this. When things started going bad, you realize they lost their family in this. Their homes were burned to the ground. 
They didn't recognize it as an attack from the Amalekites as the enemy of the Lord, the enemies of the Lord coming in after them. What did they do? They turned and they blamed their leadership. Hello? Isn't it just like us to find, figure out a way to blame somebody else? <laughs> and the reason that David cried is interesting. It doesn't say that he was weeping over the loss of his family. The Bible says he wept because those 600 turned on him and were going to stone him for what had happened. You know, when you've got somebody that believes in you, Pastor, and is right there with you through warfare and they've seen the power of God and then a little adversity comes and they turn on you, it breaks your heart, doesn't it? just breaks your heart. If you haven't been there, friend, it's a, it's a devastating thing. People that come up and hug your neck and love you and tell you how great you are and how awesome God is moving in this church and so forth, and yet when a little bit of hardship comes, a little bit of difficulty comes, they want to blame you for it. Amen? Hurts, friend. David, David was devastated. He cried out to God. And he inquired two things. So listen to me, church. This is, the, this is the meat of it here this morning. He asked two questions. He encouraged himself. He said, David encouraged me. He found strength in the Lord. He encouraged himself. And he asked this question. He inquired of the Lord in verse 8. Shall I pursue this party? In other words, should I go after the enemy? Secondly, if I go after the enemy, will I be successful? How many believe those are two good questions? If you're going to pursue the enemy, you better know there's going to be a victory. I mean, especially after that level of devastation, I don't want to go after the enemy, Lord, if you're not going with me. And besides the point, I don't even know where they are. So he cries out, and the Lord responds twofold. Go after them, number one, and number two, you will be successful. And I want to tell you this morning, friend, what prompted this and what began to move in me on this message. As you look around and you see the, the drumbeat and you hear the drumbeat of war across our country right now. And right now, even as I speak, they're staging over in the Middle East, ready to strike. We're going to wake up one morning and find out that we bomb Baghdad or whatever it is. And I want you to hear me, friend, as we understand there's an aggression going on on our part. It's going to protect the interest of America, recognizing if we sit on our hands, the enemy will come, and we are not going to wait for some nuke to be dropped on us first. If we don't act now, the aggressor, the enemy, of a, of, is going to come and deal with us. So we're getting ahead of it. Listen to me, friend. Scripturally, I believe it's a God thing that if you are on the backside of the enemy this morning, running for your spiritual life, it's time you stop in your tracks, recognize who you are in God, turn around, get off your hands, get off your seat, and go after it in Jesus' name. The question we need to ask ourselves this morning, are we going to sit there and mourn over what has been taken, or are we going to get aggressive in Jesus' name, get up and deal with the enemy? I want to tell you, friend, we need to recognize we have an adversary. Now, I want to tell you right, right up front, I guarantee you we, there's people in this room that give a whole lot more credit to the enemy than he deserves. I mean, I, I mean, all of us have heard, you know, every time something happens in your life, you're telling me that the enemy's attacking you. I would like to believe that, friend, but in a lot of cases, you're flattering yourself to believe you're doing anything for God to that degree that you would merit the limited resources of the enemy to come after you personally. You can say amen there. Come on. Sometimes we're just walking in disobedience. Sometimes we bring it on ourselves because we don't listen to the man of God or we don't follow sound instruction or wisdom. We just figure we want to do it our own way. We fall on our face and we blame the devil for it. The devil is nowhere in the place, friend. You just rejected the truth. Is anybody hearing me this morning? But there are times when the enemy has had his way with us. We've left a spiritual door open. We've allowed the enemy to sneak in. And friend, listen to me. He's a conniver. He's a deceiver. He will slide in where there's an opening. He knows where your weakness is. He knows where my weakness is. God, he knows where my weakness is. In fact, we need to watch what we say. I said we need to watch what we say that we don't give him ammo to defeat us. I'm a firm believer. I don't see anywhere in Scripture that Satan can read our minds. I don't see anywhere he has that authority. Somebody say amen this morning. Amen. So if he's the accuser of the brother, and if he's coming against us, if he's waging war, if he knows our Achilles heel, he probably knows it because we've been mouthing off about it. He knows about it because we've been complaining about what we don't like. You know what I mean? Friend, listen to me. We get with our friends and we start complaining about how bad things are. We complain about this and that. We have, we have a critical spirit. And all of a sudden, I'm telling you, there's some demon in hell taking notes on everything you say. 
And at the appointed time, they will use that point of weakness to come and destroy your life. Don't give them any ammunition this morning. Don't give them a weapon to form against you in Jesus' name. David set out not knowing what to do. And sometimes, friend, we just need to put one foot in front of the other. Hear me, church. I said sometimes we need to put one foot in front of the other. I want to speak to that segment of people who are waiting for a verbal word from God before you get moving in 2003. Friend, you may be waiting a long time. And I know that, boy, that, that went over real good, Brother Gary. <laughs> oh, man. I want to tell you, friend, there's times the Lord speaks. He speaks in different ways. He speaks sometimes by confirmation. Sometimes he speaks by shutting down one area, closing a window and opening up another one. Sometimes he speaks through a friend. Sometimes he speaks through your children. And let me say, sometimes we need to make our priority what it ought to be. When I talk about what the enemy stolen, I'm going to ask you this morning, friend, what has he stolen from you? You say, well, he's stolen my joy. Well, why has he stolen your joy? Well, he's got my kids. He's abducted them. They're in the world. They're not serving the Lord. Here you are down here at Brownsville, the revival. Maybe you're in BRSN. Maybe you graduated. Here you are pursuing God. But something was broke, friend. Hear me, friend. You've gotten so caught up in your calling that your family got neglected. Your kids got left on the outside. I've seen it. This thing's been going on for a while, friend. You can analyze a little bit. You can look around and see some things. And one of the troubling things to me with a pastor's heart, I've seen people up here passionately going after God. Moms and dads, while their kids were out there in the foyer trying to find their way. Listen to me. Satan will use even a move of God to get a stronghold on your family. There's kids right now that are not in this revival that were in it five years ago, but they're not here today. Because when they hear the word revival, that means they're getting cheated out of their mom and dad one more night. Is anybody hearing me? One more night. That means that we're going to get dropped off the babysitter or left in the back. Listen, I'm all for being in every, every meeting that there is. We need to be faithful in God's house, but bring your kids with you. When you go to the altar, friend, you grab them by the arm and say, we're going to go seek God. You take them with you. I said you take them with you. Demonstrate, let them experience the power of God firsthand. But your first ministry, before you go to the ends of the earth, is to minister to your family. Don't be here. Now, I'm speaking to some lady that's here that's going after God with all of your heart. You've got a passion. Lord spoke to my heart. Bless God, I'm going to school. I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to be an evangelist. I'm pursuing full-time ministry. And you're neglecting your unsaved husband. You've left him behind. You say, I'm doing what God wants to do, and you're rolling on, friend. That's not how you're going to win him to Jesus. And your heart broke today because you didn't take care of your first responsibility. There is no greater ministry than that of your family. Somebody say amen. I'm preaching the truth to you. The enemy's come in and stolen it out from you. And today you're not walking in the victory the Lord wants you to because you need to shore up an open door. You need to go back and lock something you left open need to fix something in 2002 before you see the victory in 2003. Something is broken. Is anybody hearing me? Something needs to be dealt with. And I'm telling you, the enemy of your soul knows that point of weakness. Friend, you can't be effective for God until you're living in victory. As long as you're a casualty, as long as you're walking wounded, you cannot be out there and be effective. How are we going to reach a lost and dying world if we're no more healthy than they are? How in the world is the city of Pensacola going to be touched by what God's doing if we're no different than they are? If we're dysfunctional, if we've got wayward children, if we've got kids in rehab, if we can't keep our marriages together, if we're out there at the workplace and we're bad-mouthing our boss and we're struggling and we're walking around in depression. Friend, I want to tell you something right now. There's nobody on this planet going to want to sign up for what we've got if that's the way we're behaving. Somebody say amen. Let's start walking like children of God. Let's start ministering and showing them the example of what God's done in us. It's not about talking about what the Lord has done. It's about demonstrating. It's about modeling it in Jesus' name. If God's touched you in this revival, then let your kids see it. Let your unsaved spouse see it in Jesus' name. Let the greatest fruit of this revival, you say, what are the manifestations? Well, friend, it's not about shaking, jumping, and shouting, and falling. It's about the manifestation of a marriage that was once broken and is now healed in Jesus' name. It's the manifestation of a strained marriage that has now come back together. It's about the reconciliation of a child who was once away from God and now has come to know Him as Lord and Savior. Can you say amen? The pivotal point we need to recognize, friends, is the Lord can use anything at His disposal to fix your situation. Let me say that again. 
The Lord can use any means to fix your situation. Stop putting him in a box. David sell out after the enemy, not even knowing where to look. But God had a plan. The Bible says that David and his men came to the ravine at Basor. And they'd been traveling probably 10 to 15 miles to get to that ravine. Look right there in the scripture. It points that out. And it says that of the 600 that were there, 200 of them said, Dave, you go on. We're too tired. Now, I don't know about you, friend. If, if, if the enemy's got my family, I'm motivated. You know what I'm saying? Forget, I, I don't care. Give me a piece of beef jerky and a little water. I'm good. Let's go. I'm going after my wife and my kids. Somebody say amen. I'm motivated. I'm not, not, I, I know I'm cramping up. I know I'm weary. It's been a 10-mile hike. But, I, I mean, can you imagine? Hey, uh, Dave, go, I can't go on. I mean, she's a blonde, about 5'7". I got a couple kids. If you could get them, it'd be great. Go figure. I don't understand how somebody could do that, but that's what happened. 200 did not go on because they were weary. And I want to challenge you this morning as we come to the last service in 2002. Do not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you'll reap if you faint not. About the time you're ready to give up, friend, that's when the breakthrough's coming. About the time you're ready to throw in the towel, I'm talking to somebody that's talking about going back home or going back to where you were and going back to the way things, going back to whatever normal is. Friend, don't do it. You burn that bridge. There's nothing there. Don't go back to where you left God. He's not there. He's moving on. Can you say amen? And I want you to understand if you're here at the ravine and you're at a pivotal point in your life and you say, I don't know what we're going to do this new year. Hold on to the Lord. There's going to be a way. He's going to fix it, friend. Can you say amen? He can fix every problem in your life while you sleep tonight in Jesus' name. There's nothing too difficult for him. Come on, friend. Stand on the word of God. This is where maturity kicks in. You say, I don't feel anything. So what? So what? Whoever said it was about what you felt. Whoever said the Word of God only works when you're on the mountaintop, when you're getting gospel bumps, when God's moving. Friend, this morning, we need to take a hold of what the enemy has done and say, I'm going after him in Jesus' name. David didn't stop. Okay, you guys, you go ahead and hang out here at the 400 with me. Come on, let's go on. Where are we going? I don't know, but the Lord's my, my commander. We're going. He sets out not knowing how and where he's going to find his family, but the Lord set up something for him. He comes across a man, an Egyptian servant, on the side of the road, out of nowhere. This is a servant of one of the Amalekites. He's one of the enemy. Say that with me this morning. One of the enemy. He's an outsider. He's not one of David's men. This is not a godly, angelic being that God sent. He's using someone from the other camp. He's using, the, the, he's using someone who probably lit a match to his house. In fact, the, the Egyptian, from what I read, doesn't even gather the fact that this is a, a, a party going after the ones he just got through raiding their place. If he did, he'd, he'd shut his mouth and not say anything, you know. But he starts to rattle off. He's hey, you know, I was with these guys, we Malachites. We went in and we, we raided Ziglag. We burned their house. Man, you should have seen it. Burn. David's going, oh, yeah. Yeah. David could have said, give me a sword, fellas. We'll deal with this right now. Amen? Didn't say that. Give him something to eat. Give him something to drink. Let him get his strength back. I want to talk to him. The Bible says this young Egyptian servant was revived. And if you, I, I don't know if you're a person who writes in your Bible. I got written down in my notes in my Bible. I've got the first snitch recorded in Scripture. <laughs> the, the first informant listed here. And here's what he said. He said, listen, if you don't kill me and you don't tell my master that I told you, I'll show you where they're at. And God took the enemy. Are you getting this? He took the most unlikely candidate and brought him right in the path of David to show him where his family was. He told him that you're going to, he said, David, listen, trust in me, you'll recover everything. You'll get it all back. But David didn't know how he was going to do it. But God had a plan. Somebody say amen. amen. Say God has a plan. God has a plan. Say it again. God has a plan. And I'm telling you, you can't understand it, but God knows how to bring it about. And as a result, they take the, the 400 men go down to the edge of, of the valley there. And there the Egyptian points out and says, there they are. They look down and there they are with all the family, with all the spoil. The Bible says David goes down, friend, and he wage, wages war. And they, they take them all. 
I mean, they, they, they kill them all. About 400 of them got away, the Bible says, but the Lord is very, very faithful to be with David, and he is a victor in this, this uh, battle. And the Bible says that David recovered everything. Let's look at it together. The Bible says he recovered everything. Are you with me on this now? It says here in verse 18, David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else that had been taken. David brought everything. Say everything. Everything, everything back. When the Lord does something, he does it right. He does it completely. And I want you to know that David was able to recover everything the enemy had stolen. Not because he sat in the camp and interceded. Hello? And I'm telling you, there's a time for intercession. There's a time to pray. There's a time to fast. There's a time to mourn. Ecclesiastes is very clear about there being times to do this. But there's a time for action. There's a time for you and I to mobilize. There's a time for us to take arms. Right now, as I said earlier, I think it's interesting that as we look around in our country, we are feeling, we are feeling this, this, this anticipation that something is about to happen. Listen, there's all kinds of things going on in the heavenlies that you cannot imagine. Do you understand right now, friend, we are getting ready to leave this planet? Do you believe that? There's got to be an urgency. You say, well, I'm just kind of waiting on God. What are you waiting for, friend? We don't need a five-year plan. We've got to get busy. The world is on their way to hell. We've got to do something now. The enemy has had his way with the church for too long. I'm tired of hearing about another preacher that's quit. I'm tired of hearing about another church that's folded. I'm tired of hearing about dissension amongst the brethren. I'm tired of hearing about division. It's time, friend, we take the glory that is on us and do something with it. You ought to be shouting me down this morning, church. Some of you are here this morning and you say, man, I, I, I hear you, preacher, but I don't know this Jesus that you speak of. I, I don't have that relationship. I've been kind of going it alone this past few years, and it's been difficult. Friend, you don't have to leave here that way. You and Jesus can hook up this morning. And you can have your life changed and transformed to the uttermost. I want you to understand that is what this move of God is about. It's not about collecting resources or, or, or books or, or tapes or... Or, or crowds. It's about change. It's about moving on this land and making a difference for Jesus' sake. We don't want to be a memory, Brownsville. We don't want to be a part of history. We want to be history makers. I said we want to be history makers. And I know that's the heartbeat of this church. I know it's the heartbeat of our pastor. Thank God for a pastor that declares the word of God. I know it's his passion to see God move. But let me tell you right now, friend, there's a mighty army right here in this room right now. And you say, I just don't feel a part of it. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in the background. I, I used to serve God. I used to be, uh, I used to be in, in, in right standing, but I'm not there. Friend, don't leave here today that way. Now, I want to close this morning. I want you to listen very carefully to me. This is so vital. I want to ask you again, and I want you to evaluate. I believe I'm hearing from God this morning. I really want you to, to think about this. What area in this past year especially would you say, Brother Gary, I feel the enemy has come into my life, come into my home, and ripped me off. Maybe you're here this morning and you put a good face on it. You come up here and you worship and you praise. You go after God with a fervency. But if the truth be made known, the enemy has come in and burned some things in your life. He's taken some of your spiritual possessions. Things that you had three years ago, you don't have now because they're in the possession of someone else. You know, we sing a song here at this church. We've sang it for years. Lindell sang it. I don't know how much, I don't know if he really likes the song anymore, but we sang it a lot here for a while. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. I once heard someone say that they didn't know how biblical that song was. I think it's real biblical. I just showed you that it's real biblical. I want you to hear me this morning, friend. You have to make a decision. Are you going to be a victim? Are you going to be a victor this morning? Is 2003 going to be a repeat? Is, he going to, is, that, is, is the enemy going to come in and give you the knockout punch this year? Or is this the one where you get up off the mat, recognizing you read the end of the book, you already know who wins? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And you start walking like a child of God. You say, I don't know where to go. Walk, friend. Walk. Do it in Jesus' name. Step out. 
Listen, I have a pastor's heart. There's no way in the world I would counsel you to do something foolish. I wouldn't tell you to step out and, and do something that would harm your family or, or hurt you financially or de devastate your, your, your marriage or your children. But I'm telling you, friend, there's got to be an element of faith here. And I'm telling you right now, if there was ever a time for the body of Christ to rise up, it's now. I'm tired of hearing about the enemy taking somebody hostage. It's time we rise up and recognize who we are in God and know that we truly are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I want everybody in this house right now to stand to your feet. Everyone. Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't want any moving around. I believe I'm coming to the most important time in the service. I want to ask you a question this morning. How desperate are you for the Lord today? You say, well, man, if, if the enemy had my kid, if the enemy had taken my wife, that would be all the motivation I need to go after it. Well, I'm talking to a bunch of folks here this morning, and that's exactly what the enemy's done. You've got ADT protecting your house and your stuff. You always make sure before you go to bed at night, sir, you go there and you walk by over there to the, to the door and you turn that deadbolt. And you think you've done a good job. You've got a fenced-in yard, and you've done a good job protecting your family. And you're right. They're protected real good, physically speaking. But you've got other doors open. You've got a kid upstairs that you become so intimidated by, and he jumps on that Internet every night. You know he's looking at things he shouldn't, but you haven't got the courage to go up there and deal with it. Oh, you're praying for him. You come up here, and you get prayer every week, and you say, Oh, God, please get a hold of Junior. He's visiting, he's, he's, he's out with the wrong crowd. He's doing things he shouldn't do. In Jesus' name, I, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm too practical this morning. This, maybe, maybe this just isn't spiritual enough for Brownsville. But in Jesus' name, why don't you just go upstairs and yank that modem right out of the wall in Jesus' name. Start being a parent. Deal with it. Deal with it. I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Go up there and deal with it. Oh, man, there's some stuff coming on the TV, and I know it's wrong. I just wish they'd quit watching that junk. Oh, God, please speak to them. Would you go over there and turn the channel? Take control of that remote, sir, ma'am. Are you hearing me? Deal with it. God has put you there. David didn't sit there and say, Lord, please bring back my family. He said, come on, fellas, we're going after him in Jesus' name. We're taking him back. Come on, friend. This morning, it's time for the body of Christ to rise up. You say, man, I tell you what, I've been so depressed lately. The enemy has been on my back. There's so much going on. Friend, listen to me. Bad things happen to good people. David had every reason to turn tail and run. He could have questioned God. He could have said, Lord, what have I done to deserve all of this? Job could have turned on the Lord. But friend, these are men of God who recognize there's enemies out there that do not want them to succeed. Do you understand that David was raided by the Amalekites? That's the same group of people that God told Saul to destroy. And because of intimidation, Saul did not obey God. And now they came back to haunt David later. Is anybody hearing me? What another generation didn't deal with, somebody else is going to have to. And I want you to get this truth this morning. David was out raiding all kinds of other people. He was on the offensive going after the enemies of God. Read it in chapters 26 through 29. When you're out there messing with the enemy, you're going to make some enemies. You say, well, why is the enemy attacking? Probably because you're doing something for Jesus. If you're out there, listen, friend. The enemy is just as content this morning to have you sitting here week in and week out, coming to revival, living for Jesus, doing nothing for him. I, I, I want to make this point very clear. I don't want it to be misunderstood. I want you to get this this morning. He is just as content to have a church neutralized as he is to have it backslidden. Either way, he wins because he's got you right contained where you can't do anything for, against him. He's afraid of a mobile church. He's afraid of a mobilized body of Christ who is more than what the sum parts of what they are on Sunday morning on a revival or on a revival night. The church and ministry starts when we leave this place today. I'm speaking to maybe a pastor that's here today or a visitor. You're going back to a hellish situation. 
you saying, man, I'm going back. I, I feel like going back into my own church is the enemy's camp. <laughs> I want to tell you, friend, you don't go by yourself. You don't go alone. The Lord is with you this morning. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. I know, I know that I know that what I'm sharing this morning is of God. You say, Brother Gary, I'm here tonight or this morning. And the enemy has had his way with my family, especially this past year. He's got, his, he's got strongholds in my, my children. My marriage is shaky at best. Or, or maybe you're here today and you've got sin in your life. Listen to me, sir. You left a spiritual door open. And the enemy has come in and he's captivated you with lust. You've got yourself doing things that Jesus would never do. You've compromised your walk at work. Hear me. You've let down your guard. You used to have such a passion for God. But suddenly the enemy of your soul has come into your house. He set up shop, and he's stolen the most precious thing that you ever had in your house, and that was the glory. He's come in, and he's taken right out from under you. Now, we can stay here today, and we can talk about it. We can leave here just like we were when we came in and say, you know what, next year I'm going to do something about that. Or we can start right now, right now on the 29th day of December 2002. We can say before this year is out, there comes a time where the man and woman of God have to be the man and woman of God. You've got to stand up and be counted for Jesus' sake. You've got to be Jesus with skin on. You've got to take control of the situation. Friend, listen to me today. Don't leave here like you came. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, you say, Brother Gary, I'm here today and I'm away from God. I know that I am. If the sky was to split right now and the Lord was to descend with a shout, the sound of the archangel, if the church was to be raptured, I guess I could call myself maybe a member of a church, but I know that I know that I'm not ready to meet God. I know that my heart's not right. I'm away from God today, and I don't want to go another day. I don't want to go into the new year without knowing that I know that I'm ready to meet God. I've got sin in my life, preacher. I know that. And right here in front of my family, in front of witnesses, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I, I want him in my life. I want to make a difference today. I want to, I want to get off my hands and I want to go after I want to go after the enemy today I want to take back what he's stolen I'm going to get that salvation back I'm going to work it out today I'm going to go after the Lord listen to me friend the Bible says draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you that's an action verse do you understand you have to take the affirmative you've got to do something for the Lord to, to approach you you've got to approach him with our heads bowed you say brother Gary I'm here today I need Jesus in my life and I don't want to go another day without knowing I'm ready to meet him I want you to lift your hand up all across this building right now lift it high Lift it high. I don't know the Lord, but I want to know Him. Up in the balcony, yes. Raise it high. Don't be ashamed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now let me address Brownsville. Let me address the body of Christ this morning that I love so much here today. You say, Brother Gary, I'm here today, but I'll be honest. The enemy has come in this last year, and he's had his way in some areas he shouldn't have had his way. He's messed with my head. He's He's taken away my joy. He's, there's, he's brought a cloud over my life and my family. He's taken some things that don't belong to him. And I'm not going to go another minute allowing that. I'm going after it today. And you say, Brother Gary, I'm here today, and I'm going to recover. I am going to go in the, in the spiritual realm. I am going to go into the enemy's camp starting right now. And I'm going to take those things back. I'm going to claim them for Jesus right now. If that's the cry of your heart, if that's where you are right now, without looking around, without hesitating, I want you to step out right from where you are and come and stand across the front right now, all across this building right now. Hurry. Don't wait. Hurry right now. Be aggressive, friend. Don't walk like you're squeamish. Walk like you mean what you're going to say and what you're going to do here today. Come on. Say, i got to take back my family. i got to take back my loved ones i got to get back the joy of the Lord in my heart. I've got to get back the vision. Listen to me, church. I'm speaking to somebody here. You had a dream four years ago, and the enemy came in, and he stole that dream right out of your life. Oh, you used to talk about what you were going to do for God. You used to talk about how God was going to move in and through your life, but the enemy came in and stole that right out from under you. You're not talking that way anymore, friend. We're not going to worry about talk. We're going to be action. We're going to be people of action today. Can you say amen? Move right on in as close as you can. Come on in. Hallelujah. Brownsville, I want you to begin to pray right now. 
If you're walking in victory this morning, you're sitting back there saying, man, the Lord's been so good to me. I'm on the mountaintop. You need to understand there's a whole lot of people up here that are hurting this morning. A whole lot of people up here have been violated by the enemy. And I want you to know that Job was a recipient, a recipient of, of the enemy's attack. David, a man after God's own heart, was a recipient of the enemy's attack. Are you hearing me? You're not less of a person because the enemy has had his way with you. But friend, there's something broken in you if you sit where you're at and allow him to continue to walk over your life. Now let me say something prophetic to this church. The Lord is going to move on us again. I said the Lord is going to move on us again. Not in the way that we think. Because he's God, he's already showed himself to be that. But I'm going to tell you right now, friend, we can't sit around and wait for it. We, a, a, a great evangelist you had in here not too long ago made a great statement. He said, instead of looking for a move of God, we need to be a move, a move of God. And I believe that. Even now, as America is assembling an army to protect the freedoms of our country, I believe God wants to assemble this army to leave this place and go after all that he has for us. No fear. I said no fear in Jesus' name. The Lord's not the author of it. No intimidation. Some of you, this, this Christmas, this Christmas, hear me. I know I'm telling the truth this morning. As sure as I'm standing here, your family members came in and your witness shut down, friend. Everything that you believe in. I mean, oh, man, you speak it big here at church, but you get your mom shows up or your dad who's unsaved or a brother or sister, and it all shuts down. And you were silent when you should have spoke up. It was a chance for you to share your, your faith, and you didn't share it. And the enemy has stolen your witness. I said he's stolen your witness. This morning, friend, we're going to get it back in Jesus' name. I want you to lift your hands toward heaven right now as a sign of surrender. And this skinny little evangelist, a nobody, by the standards of the world is going to pray over you and God is going to set you free. You are never going to be the same after today. Never, ever, ever going to be the same. The point of contact right now is going to be, listen, it might be the very, it's going to open the floodgates. It might be the one thing. You see, something has been dammed up and listen, friend, it's not the Lord, it's us that holds it back. Let's get it fixed. Let's bolt the door. Let's, let's make sure we've shut out the enemy today right now in Jesus name lift your voices right now and pray with me dearly father right now in the name of Jesus I release the power of Almighty God on the body of Christ right now I rebuke the devourer in Jesus name Satan you had your way with God's people long enough get your hands off of God's property now in the name of Jesus go leave them alone right now in the name of Jesus we take arms we put on the full armor of God, recognizing the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principality and powers, rulers of darkness in high places. We know it's a spiritual battle, so right now, in the name of Jesus, we put on that armor. We gird ourselves right now with the preparation of the truth. We get ready to go to battle in Jesus' name. Listen to me, church. In the name of Jesus, take arms in Jesus' name. Go after that wayward son right now in Jesus' name. Lift him up before God. Father, we call him in right now. Lord, you know where they are, whether it be in California, whether it be in New York, New Jersey, Georgia, Alabama, whether it be in Mississippi, Father, Colorado, Oregon, Washington State. Father, if they be across the miles, Lord, you know them by name, Father. Send whoever you need to send. God, do whatever you got to do. But right now, in the name of Jesus, in the heavenlies, we go after him in Jesus' name. We will not settle any, for anything less than full victory. We will recover it all. I said we'll recover it all in Jesus' name. We will pursue the enemy, and we will be victorious. For if God be for me, who can be against me? I said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Come on, friend. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord's going to raise up a standard. Lift your hands right now and say, thank you for the standard that you're raising up right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Say with me, church, right now, dear Jesus, starting right now, I take back what the enemy has stolen. I ask you, Lord, if I've allowed sin into my life for you to forgive me. 
if I've left a door open, by the power of your spirit, close that door. Right now, whatever it is that has been sucking the spiritual life out of me, I cut it off at the root in Jesus' name. I repent. Father God, thank you that you are the God of the second chance. You've been so gracious to me. And right now, as I move into this new year, I leave this place in victory. I don't know how you're going to do it, but just as you use the enemies of God to show David the enemy, you can use any resource that you choose. I'll just trust in you. Thank you, Father. I said thank you, Father, that the victory is mine. And today, by my proclamation, by a decision of my will, I'm marching into the enemy's camp. And I'm going to take back what he stole from me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give him praise.